how this works together, but I know some of you have this. So we need to pray the where and some of you gifted artsy people, how we put this together with um, you know, David and Billy and family there in a place where we're going to see it, and it'll remind us to, uh, uh, well, honor the Lord and pray for them. So we need to be doing that, or please, as, as the Lord leads. So if you've got your Bibles, please open them up to Romans chapter 12. Keep a ribbon there. We will be there as we continue. I would like to open up with prayer. Father, more than we will probably ever be able to conceive, we need the one who sustains all things by the word of his power, the one who knows all things, the one who is all good, the one who is everywhere and will never be in a place where you're not. Lord, thank you for revealing that to us. I would like to just ask also, Father, that you reveal everything that you know everyone needs, Lord, to everyone's heart individually, and Father, as a fellowship to our hearts collectively, whether we're here or whether we're joining online, Lord, that we're meeting with you and that your perfect will is done, Lord, your way by you for your glory. Ask and thank you in faith in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So... If you've got your Bibles open to Romans chapter 12, picking up where we left off in verse 9, I want to focus on one word uh, as means of an introduction, the word let. And if you're reading from the New King James translation, it's in italics, and if you've read the most helpful part of your Bible and realizing how your Bible works, you know italics indicates that that word has been supplied in English, and it's not actually there in the originating language Greek in this case, right? But several translations have that, let, but I believe it's extremely helpful here for reasons that I want to further illustrate because there's a bit of a cautionary note as we look at this particular section of scripture. Please allow me to illustrate with a reference that I have to admit, I wasn't sure if people were gonna actually know who this guy was. I know most of you will, but some of you, like the younger people. Wesley, I'm going to try this on you, if you're will. Or I'll just say young people. I won't, I won't uh, single anybody out. Do you guys know who Adolf Hitler is? Wes, ever heard of him? Okay, I, I didn't think somebody would, right? But, um, so for those of you who did, good guy, posters, somebody you want to be like, what do you know about Adolf Hitler? Please, just go ahead and share it with me quickly if you know anything. Yeah. Oh, Caleb. The Fuhrer of, the Fuhrer of man. Ex, that, you go, moved to the front of the meal line there by the fear. Oh, yeah, he was the leader of Germany. Do you know what kind of things he did or what he's infamous for? Yeah, killing tens of millions, right? I've heard estimates 13 million. I don't think we know. But in a quest for world domination in the 1940s, World War II was all about that, right? set out to exterminate the Jewish race. We know he's fighting against God and that didn't happen, but killed at least six million of them, millions of others, right, in an attempt to move a satanic agenda. So evil doesn't begin to describe the acts of Adolf Hitler. He's one of the guys that you could safely pick from history and say, if there's a bad guy that you want to use for an illustration, Adolf Hitler will work. So that's why I picked them here. So what we know or what I've read historically about the end of Adolf Hitler's life is somewhat unconfirmed circumstances as the uh, allied soldiers uh, were closing in on his position. Germany was failing as an army and Adolf Hitler, knowing his end was near, took his own life, committed suicide in a bunker, uh, presumably with his mistress, also, and then there's a, this is where the details get more sketchy. Um, did they find his remains? They didn't they find his remains? It was never really conclusive, and that led to all kinds of things like, oh, he's really alive and living in South America and stuff. But no, he's not alive anymore, right? And, and there were some photos of his remains, but still, they can't, nobody knows where they're interred or anything like that. So, here's the deal. <laughs> Evil guy. Let's say, for the sake of illustration, they've absolutely found the remains of Adolf Hitler. 
Here's a guy that the world never had the opportunity to try for his overwhelming amount of crimes against humanity. But they find his remains and the international tribunal says, justice delayed no longer. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take those remains and we're going to put them on trial. And when he's found guilty, we're going to impose the appropriate sentence on them. Let me ask you this. If we were to do that, what would that do for Adolf Hitler? Not a thing, right? Adolf has left the building. He's no longer here, right? He, and where he is, there's no help. But since you have a ribbon in your Bible here, keep it there. Turn to the left to Romans chapter 6 by means of a super brief review. Because what is true of Adolf Hitler in the fact that he's dead is true of you, Christian, because we're all guilty before God. Not the likeness of him, but even Adolf could have found repentance, which he didn't, apparently. But what's true of him in his current state is true of you, Christian, if you're listening. Romans 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, speaking of Jesus. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. In our old selves, the illustration with a dead man being put on trial is helpful because it illustrates this principle. The law has no effect on one who has died. There's nothing more the law can do to a dead man. And the reason that we're talking about this today is because in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, we're in one of those passages, and there's several like this in the New Testament, that read like a list of to-dos or don't-dos or laws, if you will. But what we've been told what the Lord has made us aware of, if he has opened our mind to this point, is we have these things, but there's a different response. If we seek to leave here today, and you're going to get just a beauteous list in this passage of, okay, I, now I know what to do. I'm going to go give it my best shot. That's not going to do anything for you. The law has nothing that it can do, no power over a dead person, but yet there is a revelation of God's very best for his children. The most perfect explanation of what seems like a good thing, oh, now I know what to do, do this, don't do that, is found in the New Testament when we're told these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but they're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So what is the Lord telling us? Well, as we've began here in Romans chapter 12, as we said, at this point in the book, this is a great big turning point because the first 11 chapters deal with what the Lord has done for us because of who we are, guilty before him. We are crucified, but also risen too to the newness of life. So we could accurately entitle Romans chapter 12, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, right? What God can, wants to, and will do with those who trust him in faith. Beginning in chapter 12, the first couple of verses, presenting ourselves. You no doubt have been in a very painful experience if you've agreed with that passage and you've tried to do it. You've given it your best efforts in your strength, which is dead. You made yourself a little law. Now I'm prison, okay? And nothing happened. And somebody like me is telling you about the power of God based on Romans chapter one, right? The power of God to salvation to make you like Jesus. Oh, it's there, it's real. But it's not your power, it's his power, even the ability to present comes from the Lord by request. And then we, last week, looked at the uh, portion where we talked about individual ministries within the church. 
there are those who say, okay, this is what the Lord wants, and they give it their best effort and put everything they've got into it because that's how they approached Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Give it all I got. And then we read about things like ministerial burnout and people who just, yeah, I was in church. I did that for a while, and it just doesn't do anything for me and, and those things. And there's a reason for that because it's all you, the dead guy. You and a dead guy in the law, there's nothing that's going to happen out of that. So now we get down to this portion, which I said last week, if you didn't see a direct application in every passage speaking about church offices, you will, because everything we talk to applies to every Christian without exception in these verses. And we begin with this very helpful word, let. Let. It indicates to us that this is something the Lord will do if we let him. So I would entitle today's teaching, let it be versus make it happen, right? So let's go through these and look at a few things as we do in this first verse of Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Now you might be thinking, you know, you're a little bit thin on that it's the Holy Spirit who does this because it reads like we're supposed to do this. But notice some of the key words beginning with this one. Let love, that should trigger something in your mind. Love is a very specific fruit or result of the Holy Spirit working through someone. Love is who God is. So when we think let love, right? Now, we don't want to separate it from its context. Let love be without hypocrisy. The simplest definition of the word used as hypocrite wasn't a put down, but referred to someone who was, well, as an actor. We would think a Hollywood type actor. They're playing at something or, or representing something who they're really not, right? Someone can get up and, and uh, act out the role of Abraham Lincoln. Well, guess what? They're not Abraham Lincoln. So what the Lord is telling us here whether we read it in this translation, let love, or other translations, love must be without hypocrisy. If that's going to be the real thing, as he explains it, guess what? Only he can provide it. And you've been there. You've read Jesus' commands, and you've accepted it with all your heart, and love your neighbors all yourself, and try as you might, you can't do it. Fact, none of us can, but he can. It's who he is. So when we think about love, let it be without hypocrisy. And all of us can give a pretty good representation. We can keep it up for a little while. But we know the Lord's looking at the heart. So I want this to be for you today, consistent with my leading. Don't take this away as a list of rules, do's or don'ts. But as we look at these things, it's an opportunity to do a little self-check or self-examination, and how wonderful as we're running up into communion uh, next Sunday. Because this is how the, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. It's like, wow, I'm practicing love, but yeah, Todd, how's it, where's it coming from? Me. You're not feeling it, are you? No, I'm not. Well, that's good. Okay, what's wrong here? It's because it's me. And it's not you, Lord. But when I just, verse 1 and 2, present, Lord, I'm yours to do with. And the Lord has got, it's a whole different thing. Everything changes. So let love be without hypocrisy. May I add authentic, the real deal, his love. That's what the Lord is telling us. Consistent with that is abhor what is evil. Literally hate. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Now I think that was added in to reinforce the first part. Pretending love or, or our version of love, it would be like Adolf Hitler, rising unrepentant Adolf Hitler showing you favor or love. Whew, that's just all kinds of wickedness there. Scripture is not silent on this. We'll, we'll put several scriptures on the screen today in support of this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. We see... 
church in Corinth this was written to, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, the, the real or genuine article, following this up with another one from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. Brothers and sisters, there is no purity in us apart from Christ. And from a good conscience, those two are connected. I know when I'm faking it, and so do you. And I know when it's real, and so do you. And from sincere faith. So the Lord is more than abundantly clear as this line is like, and it doesn't have to come from us. It can't come from us. Just allow the Lord as you present yourself a living sacrifice to have his way. Don't put any constraints because it is that growing expression and relationship with the Lord that he's working in us to make us more like Jesus. And it just continues here. Look at verse 10. Be kindly affectionate. I don't know if you can be unkindly affectionate, but kind or kindly was a word that my mind seized on because in our English definition of the fruits of the Spirit, well, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, there it is again. The Holy Spirit is never unkind, even to wicked people. When I'm unkind to people, you got to know it's me and my flesh and not the Lord. I can be uncompromised, and we must be. But a lack of gentleness, a lack of kindness, I have to own that one and repent. And so do you. I just, Paul taught me, transfer this to myself for, for your sake. I don't see myself as exempt from any of this, nor should any of us. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Imagine coming into a building where maybe it's your first time in and people are standoffish, right? Or maybe you're here all the time and people are standoffish. And you still don't know that person's name or more than their name. Or there's no... Well, the Lord started us in a new book last Wednesday, 1 John, and we saw one of the main themes was that word koinonia, which means fellowship, different than just being here. It's that intimate fellowship with the fruits of the Spirit, kindly affection. This is just what happens when the church lets the Lord have his way. No reservations. We're kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. There's a translation from the ESV. I'd like to put it uh, up here, verse 10, because I think it, it adds a little bit more support uh, in honor, giving preference. Love one another with brotherly affection. That's pretty similar, but this is, it's this next part. Outdo one another in showing honor. It's like, it's like that's what the Holy Spirit would actually do you know, having the fellowship meal would be horrible when this kicks in because nobody would get in line. No, you, no, no, after you until somebody realizes, well, I'll serve you by being first or nobody's going to eat kind of thing. But you get the idea. It's, it's tied into that Psalm 23, my cup runs over. The Lord wants to do so much more for us. And when we're in alignment with that, that will come through us. So is this a condemnation? No, it's a self-check. Wow, that that doesn't seem to be really consistent with a lot of my behavior. What does that tell me? It's not the Lord through me then. Oh, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Well, that's another translation of this, but let's turn to a place here this morning. Keeping your ribbon here in Romans 12, let's go to the right to the book of Philippians to, I hope, a passage that was already resounding in your mind this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, is about as clear as it gets here. And again, that word was supplied. Uh, let nothing be done, Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's the acid test right there. 
examine ourselves, test all things. Hey, keep that one before your mind. I think you hear that from me quite often. And it doesn't say as my flesh, let some things be, no, it's let nothing be done through selfishness. And what am I supposed to consider myself more important than you? Well, like Jesus, nothing. We're told in that passage, let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. Let it happen. Jesus standing at the door and knocking in Revelation. Let me in. And once he's in, let him out, if you will. Back here to Romans. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. The highest, most honoring thing to the Lord is to let him have his way. Others would be honored by that too. Verse 11, yeah, I did that once, right? Well, verse 11 reminds us it's not a one and done, but this is who the unchanging God is at all time. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There's times when I do it because I know it's the right thing, and, and I'll, I'll just say this. I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Actually, Scripture, I'm convinced of it. We know the passage where Jesus said, a man has two sons, right? And he tells one son, go do this. He says, I will not. And he tells the other son, go do this. And he says, I will, and he doesn't do it. And the other, the first son who said, I won't do it, he changes his mind, and he goes and does the right thing. And he ended up doing the father's will. So, I mean, even he, there's a guy who presumably didn't feel like it. Did the right thing and that still counts. But I know that that is so far away from what the Lord wants. So there's times like, wait a minute. When does the Lord not feel like doing good? And again, this is just a test. It tells me how much room for growth there still is in me. How much uncharted territory in my relationship with the Lord where I can say, okay, Lord, uh, I'm, not, I'm turning to you. It's like, I'm looking to you. You said, let this happen. You're on, Lord. Brothers and sisters, it's in those moments when you see what we've been talking about, the power of God. I was taken with a line from devotions this morning that said, in this world is not the sphere where God can fully bless you. You know where it is? It's where you're living right now on the inside where I can't see. I see the outside. But those things, when we talk about the power of God, I just, Lord, oh.
Christ has come. Patient in tribulations. I think the second reason is, is because we have a promise from the Lord that we may or may not like to claim. In this world, you will have tribulation. Be patient in it. I can't. I seek to avoid that. There again, who's living the life? Is it the Holy Spirit through me? Or is it just simply me, even though I have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit I've basically just quenched or resisted. He's bound up there, not let out. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing st- Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. I think there's a distinction made there. Again, this is, just, this is just who Jesus is. Could you imagine Jesus in any of the Gospels walking there and, and he's got 12 guys and they're, they're all hungry and Jesus has a big bag of nice figs and they're hungry and Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that. And teaching them, hey, you got to look out for yourself first. No, of course not. That's inconsistent with who he is. When he, you know, tells them to serve the others, then they gather up the leftovers for themselves. It's always others first. That's the mind of Christ, Philippians, right? And so when we're abiding, distributing to the needs, I think it's helpful to notice not the wants, right? The needs, only the Lord knows the needs. That's why it's important. Because you'll see the person with the sign. And first we're, we're talking about the saints, but it goes beyond that. You know in Scripture that Jesus walked up to people. He walked by people. Only the Lord knows people's needs. How do you know that? Well, you pray. You're steadfast in it. The Lord will direct you to who needs what, when, how, all those things. And he said, well, he mentions first to the saints, other brothers and sisters. Hey, the body of Christ. So imagine for a moment uh, that picture of a body. You have one of the members that has a need, like maybe um, blood flow. What happens with the limb if you, you, know, you take that rubber binder and you, you put it on your finger really tight so it turns purple, then you fall asleep and you wake up in the morning with, well, a candidate for amputation, right? Because that part of the body didn't get what it needed. It just doesn't happen in a healthy, functioning body. And what an illustration for the church. This body, part of the body needs it. And that part of the body is going to get it. The Lord is going to make sure to supply it. Given to hospitality might be the reference to those who aren't saints. Showing hospitality to strangers, people you don't even know. Again, that's who God is. He makes his sun to shine on the righteous and the just alike. So when we're not, guess what? It's not him in us doing that. We're leaning on our own understanding and looking out for our own needs. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Oh, this is just so so completely unknown in the world, right? But you should hear the words of our Lord echoing in your mind from a previous study here. Let's take a look back here in Matthew chapter 5. Going back to the left a few books. Matthew chapter 5. And there's actually a couple of places that we can look at here since we are here. Uh, Let's look at verse 11 first. Jesus says to everyone who has ears to hear, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, Blessed are you, favored of God is another way to say that. When, not if, 
Matthew 5, 11, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, you should actually, if you're in the spirit, feel vindicated, right? Approved by God in that. Why? Well, because Jesus said, verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They did it to Jesus, they did it to his followers, they did it to those who spoke the word of God before Jesus was born and walked the earth as a man. They're gonna do it to you as a sign of God's favor, power of God upon your life. So you're here in Matthew 5, uh, look at verse 44. Uh, Let's back it up to verse 43. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 43, you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. The Lord knows what's going to happen. Actually, he's making sure of it. You can't make a promise to someone without upholding it. In this world, you will have tribulation. All who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. No workarounds for that. Now, when Jesus said, love your neighbor, or love your enemy, rather, he also said, love your neighbor, what kind of love do you think he was referring to? Yours, the world's idea, the Hallmark card kind, or that agape, selfless, self-sacrificing love whom he is? It's that one, and it can only happen again Well, by the working of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus did. That's who Jesus is. That's what his followers did. That's what the Lord's working into this church as we pray. If it's with a sincere heart, make us the church you want us to be. Here, let me just interject this. What part of scripture do you think the Lord doesn't want to apply to a group who would pray that? Right answer is no, all of it, right? So bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Let me just whip this in there before I forget. You guys have heard me say it a lot. If the Lord is leading us to look at this time, you're probably going to have an opportunity in the not too distant future to put this into practice. And the way you put it into practice is just get yourself out of the way. And we'll pray, Lord, help us to recognize this when it happens. Father, that we might turn to you and submit to you and allow you to work through us to these people. It's needed because it just doesn't get any easier for us here as we continue on in this passage. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, verse 15. It's a natural outcome of understanding whether you feel it or not, whether you currently practice it or not, on the authority of God's word, Every Christian, every member of the body of Christ is part of the body. If we isolate ourselves in the flesh, it doesn't change the fact that if someone is hurting, the body is all hurting. If someone is going through good things, the whole body benefits. We are a part of that. It's a reminder or maybe it reveals to me, gosh, how removed I actually am or how in the spirit I'm not when I read about things that Christians are going through somewhere else or what's happened to somebody else. Well, it's not in my zip code. I guess I'm good. No, we've deceived ourselves as we live in our flesh. The Lord wouldn't tell us to do this if it isn't what he himself is doing how he weeps, how he cares over the afflictions of his children, and how he rejoices with those who rejoice. You know that song, You Dance Over Me? It's from a a different translation. The Lord does say that. He rejoices over. When? and, And how would the Lord do that? We put our best effort in and present it to him. Here, Lord, this is filthy rags. No. 
we present ourselves, we hear what he says, Father, you have done it all, you are, you want to do it all, here we are. I think the Lord is just, yeah. I always personally rejoice at that when I think it's like, the Lord has given me an opportunity to be well-pleasing to him, and he's made it simple. Verse 16 is a major application if you were thinking we were light on applications today. Something that the Lord put his finger, metaphorically speaking, on me to say, here's a big one. Here's an area where I'm growing. Here's something that the people are going to be challenged with. Here's something the people in the flesh are going to fight against. But nevertheless, it's true. And I'll make it happen. Verse 16 be of the same mind towards one another. Before we go further, you know what could, could happen? You could be a Christian. You could be in a place like this and you could, well, you could pick and choose, say this part, I'll do this part, I won't. I like this, I won't apply this. But the Lord says, no, this is all me all the time. When you're yielded to me, this is all you all the time because, you know, koinonia, the two shall be as one. The bride, the groom, I and you, you and us, Jesus said in John chapter 17, be of the same mind towards one another. Well, we'll talk in the second part of this verse how the Lord makes that happen, but let's leave absolutely no room for doubt that the Lord actually wants this to happen in case, because you know how it works in the flat. When something hits a little too close to home. It's just like, well, you know, maybe in the original language it could mean this. Well, there is no workaround on that, but lest, lest we think so, let's look at a few others. You're going to remember this one, a blast from the not-too-distant past, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren. You know that the Lord was using Paul to speak that, and somebody else was likely writing that. But it was the Holy Spirit pleading. I'm pleading. God pleading. Oh, how embarrassing that God has to plead, but he does. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Again, the model for this is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are. We're growing to be that way, okay? That's the growth process. You start out in babes, you end up mature. We're going to be growing our whole time here. That's the big revelation. That's the, the function of the church. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to conform us into the image of his son, as we've again been reminded of. So somewhere we're here on the scale, but make no mistake, this is the goal to which the Lord is working. We must be in agreement on that. So when we're in disagreement, we can recognize this isn't the Lord and we can seek him to make it right. In support of these things, Philippians, where we were, but we'll put it on the screen, chapter 2, verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. That's like the same mind. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. We have a word for all these things, unity, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, Lord willing. Again, from Philippians chapter 3, verse 16. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. See, in that first part of that verse, it allows for the fact that it's not perfect here yet. The Lord is working us towards that, but we can recognize and be in necessary agreement when we're not in agreement. We don't just let that ride. That should be priority. That we come to the same mind, first with the Lord, well, and then with one another. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 from the same book tells us, I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche, crazy name for a sister. I've not seen anybody name their kid, their little girl after that, but that was their name, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Just a reminder, real churches, real people, real problems, and a real God who addresses it. I implore you, be of the same mind. Their problem, well, they were doing the Lord's work and they were not in agreement. 
Well, that's okay. We'll just go start another division. We'll be the church that does this and we'll be the church who doesn't do this. Ever wonder why there's all kinds of denominations now and why you don't find them in Scripture and when somebody does veer off, the Lord's trying to bring them back? Because there's one Spirit, one Lord, one hope, one faith, one baptism, one God, one mind. And that's what he's conforming us into. 2 Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, some closing comments. You know, you always put the important reinforcement at the end. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete, perfect, right? It's that growing process. They weren't there, but be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Man, if that's not a good enough incentive, you know, we refer to that verse quite often. Jesus said, if two or more are gathered in my name, I am in your midst. That's a principle from a a different context in Matthew 18, but it is a principle, right? Gathered in my name? Well, was Jesus of a different mind than the Father? No. And the Father was always with him. So when we turn to him, and I don't believe, if I believed otherwise, you would have to say, God can lie, and that's not possible. If we turn to the Lord and ask the Lord to speak to us, that he'll tell us these things and then it's on. Okay. Well, I know God says this, but I think... Mm-hmm. Nope. You've just left the reservation there. But when we do this, when we're in agreement with him, well, God's here in our midst. I hope right here. Right here. Right now. The God of love and peace will be with you. Collectively be with us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, puts it this way. Finally, all of you, be of one mind. Finally, be of one mind. Having compassion for one another. We're not always going to be there at the same time. Remember, ministry in de- deals with other people, but it has to start with you. Love as brothers. Boy, that sounds familiar. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Why? Because he is. And as we yield to him, he will be as well. Did I give you two or three witnesses on this be of one mind thing? Uh, The answer is yes, if if you haven't lost it all. Hey, we're going to turn back to, uh, well, we're in Romans, but let's look at one more. It's It's a future study. Romans chapter 15. We'll hit it there again probably as we get there, Lord willing. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. Now may the God of patience, oh, there's that fruit of the Spirit again, and comfort grant you to be like-minded. Remember I said, how does this happen? Well, it doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from a plan. It is a very gift of God. It's the power of God. People are looking for the power of God to see, you know, the Red Sea parted or stones turned to bread, but the real miracle the Lord is working is to make you and I like him. And he's shown us the way. The just shall live by faith. It's by grace through faith. When we hear what God says, when we look to him in trust, when we ask him to do it, it happens. Period. In Romans 15, verse 5, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you, gift from God, to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you know. We can say we are, but you know when we all speak the same thing. Turning our way back here to Romans uh, chapter 12. Looking again at verse 16. Be of the same mind towards one another. First part, I think we covered it. Here's a little more how-to. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Right? God will grant you things. That grant or that gift, well, that's what grace is. Everything is by grace through faith. Faith means we have to hear the word of God, which we are. Faith means we put our trust in, and then God gives us what we need. It's the, the power of God to make that happen through the person of God, the ministry of his Holy Spirit. So, well, right there we've identified when this doesn't happen. Set your mind on high things. And God said this, but no, there's something about an elevation that's happened that shouldn't. 
Well, the Lord further describes it, associate with the humble. The humble are those who, biblically speaking, see themselves as they actually are in light of who God is, as we've talked about before. Being humble is just being honest about yourself. You're always going to be in a lower position of God. When I see myself as higher than God, well, I've elevated myself. I set my mind on, well, falsely high things, and we're told very clearly, God opposes the proud or the exalted or the people with the high estimation of themselves, but he gives grace to the humble. More love, more power, well, more grace, more humility, more agreement or one-mindedness with God, as he says in this verse. Do not be wise in your own opinion. I kind of seized on that word opinion. You know why? Because I think the Lord makes it clear. Because there's, there's two sets of statements when it comes to the things of God. There comes first God's word, which are facts. Unassailable truth. Then there's everything that puts itself contrary to that. Those are opinions. They're also false. Proverbs clearly tells us there is no wisdom, understanding, or counsel against the Lord. Nobody's found a workaround. God's examined everything. He puts it out plainly. That needs to be absolutely accepted in our minds. It'll save you a lot of grief and a lot of needless pain. No, God says this. You can trust him. He knows all things. If there was a better way, he'd put it out there. So whatever God's word on any situation is, that is the truth. Everything else is an opinion. And it's ultimately false. So I love that the Lord said that. Do not be wise in your own opinion, contrary to God's words. Verse 17, as we kind of close up here, repay no one evil for evil. We have already established, Jesus promised, people will do you evil when you do good. And it's it's a sign, it can be a sign that you're doing the right thing when you're following him. So what do you do in those situations? Well, the Lord really makes it clear. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. There's going to be evil out there. The time that you live in is evil. Be saved from this perverse or evil generation, this age right? That's where you are. My mind flashed back to a scene from the movie Time Changer. What do you do in this evil generation when you're really, when you're really submitted to the Lord? How much evil does the, the Lord wink at, right? Well, it's like, well, it's just that. I, I want to see that. And it was just, it wasn't too much cursing or they didn't dishonor the Lord too much in that. So, oh, well, wait a minute. The scene from the movie Time Changer that if, if you've not seen it, Time Changer holds up. It's a good movie. It, uh, if you're a Christian, it will encourage you, maybe convict you. But this man, the, the premise of the movie is a guy goes back in time, a, a Christian goes forward in time, actually, to current culture, and he goes in with a church group to see a movie, right? And we don't know what the movie is. All of a sudden, this guy just comes screaming out of the theater to the Stop the movie! They blasphemed the name of the Lord! And everybody's like, what if, huh? Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Some men or all men. Hey, I know when I'm yielded to the Spirit, there's, and I'm, I'm just going to come right out and confess it. Uh, someone sent me a, a text which was kind of a funny. It was with a kid. So I said, you know what? But the kid, through an honest mistake, had a, a different take on the name of the name of God and knowing better, well, that wouldn't be so cool. And I was the instrument of evil and shared it with a couple of people and I saw a couple of my brethren cringe. Right? And I was the guy who said, hey, check this out. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Going on, we're told there's going to be persecution So guess what? It means there's going to be persecution. Men will hate you. They'll revile you when you do good. So what's our response? Notice the condition in verse 18. If it's possible, it may not always be. Right? 
if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Hey, we have some promises from God. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. But not always. It can happen that way. It didn't go that way for Jesus all the time or all his followers. Sometimes it does. We see in, in the early church, the book of Acts, that the local people held the church in high esteem, yet none of them dared join themselves to them. Oh, they're great, but I don't want anything to do with them. I mean, they, they weren't persecuting them at that point. Later on, they did. Right? So when that time comes, when you're doing everything right, and, and there is no let up, what do you do? If it's possible, as much as depends on you, and here's the 100% of the time, because everything is an evaluation or a ministry, what you're going to be graded on is your response, not theirs. Remember that. As much as it depends on you, what they do is never justification for what you do in retaliation, as we'll see in a moment. So the Lord says, if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That means I'm never the, the cause. I never reciprocate with what the Lord explains uh, next here, verse 19, beloved, talking to Christians, do not avenge yourselves. You know, get even. You did this to me, I'm going to do this to you and a little bit more. God says no. And he also tells us why in another passage we'll speak of. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. That place where vengeance comes from Right? Well, and let's be very careful and very clear here. You as a Christian are going to see unjust things. You're going to hear about unjust things even if you don't see them. You're never going to have a warm, fuzzy response. Recent headlines two days ago, one of our states, I think it's Massachusetts, is, on, is proposing legislation, apparently is going to be voted on, that will uh, make legal abortion up to the day of delivery. Up to the moment, excuse me, moment. So mom could be in labor, right? Here come, oh, I can see the head. Doc can go in and, well, take care of the tissue. Are you ever going to feel good about that? Not in the spirit. Is the Lord? No. The Lord recognizes that when he tells us, be angry, but do not sin. Do not sin. Okay, what is that? Sin is this. For you who know to do good and do not do it, for you it is sin. Well, what is good in this situation? There's something that's just absolutely wrong, and it's just one of a, a very short list of things that is growing here. So I just need to, I got to get in there, I got to do this. And you just feel that wrath, that rang, anger welling up in you. God says, be angry, that's the correct response. But don't sin. Sin is, well, to avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord makes it very clear in the book of James that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All that's going to do is give some lost sinner controlled by Satan validation for why they should want nothing to do with him. The God of all love and mercy a God who would have even pardoned Adolf Hitler? Yeah, you get one hit and you give, you give as good as you get? Don't do it. Don't do it. God's going to do it. Don't, don't mistake. He will judge every evil work. That's why the gospel must go forward. But he needs to be represented here and now. And I've got to tell you, when that's happening, and we get tested in that, it is the hardest thing. It's one of my personal biggest growth areas is to, I, and I'm convinced, the Lord has at least to some level convinced me, one, it doesn't come naturally. I can't do that. But when I look to him in those moments, I see the Lord change me. And at times I share some of those things with you. The power of God is real. But I have to know what the facts are. I have to have him first and foremost. You're going to experience that. Probably not too long from now since we're talking about this as a church. Maybe collectively in our society, brothers and sisters. I know you read the headlines. It may be 
become very difficult to live anywhere in this country as a Christian should the Lord tarry. So, you know, we got to get more clubs and bombs and bullets and just like Jesus never did, huh? No, we need more of him. We need more grace. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. God says, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, well, that's what the not to do, but the Lord always tells you what to do. And I think there's an implied promise here. He quotes the Old Testament when he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. I think most, if not all of you already know that there's a tendency to think of, oh, this is how I get even, I'm gonna put burning coals on their head and he's gonna, ah, no. The, the picture from the context of the early church fire being what it was and is necessary, right? A good thing and, and hard to produce. You know, we don't relate to that. You go to the stove, it clicks, it bursts into flame, you got your Bic lighter, nothing. It wasn't like that in the old days, right? You had flint or you had sticks or you had whatever you had. So what they would do is once you had a fire going, they got really good at you know, putting ashes over the coals, uh, heaping them up and covering them so you'd still have hot coals in the morning. And it's really easy to get a fire going from hot coals. You move the ashes, you put a little dry tinder, a little air, and whoosh, you got flame, right? So if you got hot coals, you're, it's like the Bic lighter of its time. So what if you're without that? And Well, here, hot coals. We're going to put some ash in a pot, put the hot coals, put a little more ash. Ash is a wonderful natural insulator. And the, the tendency was to, to carry these things on their head. Let's not give you a few. Let's give you a bunch. That's why you carry this on your head, because it's heavy. Right? Oh, so it's not like I'm trying to burn his head. I'm trying to so bless him that if possible, they'll be convicted. Convicted. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And now verse 21 is part of it. Do not be overcome by evil. What's being stated is, is when I retaliate or you retaliate, evil has not only taken them out, it's pulled me into that same bondage to the enemy and sin that they're in has now overtaken me, the Christian. Right? But when I respond, as the Lord says, overcome evil with good. The tendency is to think of every time you do a good deed to someone who's being bad to you, you're going to see repentance. No, a servant is not greater than his master. Sometimes, yes, praise God. But there's a 100% victory opportunity not in the person that you're applying this to, but in the person the Lord is applying this to, which is you. Every time you do this, God is glorified. Every time you do this, there's an opportunity to be transformed, and it can be, it should be, 100% of the time. So this chapter, this beginning of this last section, is the Lord revealing what he wants to do, what he will do to those who trust him. The gospel, the good news, the power of God to salvation. Salvation, as we talk about so often, is that process by which God chooses us and calls us to himself and we respond in faith and repentance. We're born again. That's the beginning. Justified, our sins are put away. We enter as new babes into the lifelong growing process. Sanctification is ultimately going to end in glorification, being like Jesus. That's what's happening 24-7. That's what's on the Holy Spirit's mind all the time. That's what he yearns jealously to make happen. And then he moves a group of people to look to the word and to, to see the things you've seen and experienced and then to pray, Lord, we're looking to you. Make us like you. And the Lord says, okay, now I'm going to double down. This is what it looks like. It's over your head and always will be. But this is who I am and this is who you are in me. The old man's dead. Your list of rules and regulations, throw them away. They're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. But my free gift of grace comes through faith. You've heard my facts, trust me. 
ask me. I will make this happen. Oh, I'll test you. I'll give you plenty of opportunity. But when we talk about this message being the power of God to salvation, this is where the rubber meets the road. It's not in the outward signs and wonders, although God can do that. It's what's happening in you. The world is going to continue to go this way, but the Holy Spirit will lift you this way. And the brighter he shines through you, the greater the opportunity for this natural world to see the supernatural God in you. We got a choice right now, brothers and sisters. We can say, yeah, it's kind of good. Well, what am I doing later? Or we can say, Lord, we asked you to speak to us. You have. What do we do with this? Here's one encouragement. Let's be of the same mind with the Lord and one another. And let's so love one another when we find ourselves in that situation. Step and say, hey, brother, was that, was that you or was that God? Oh, well, you know, I think he'd be okay. I think that the Lord is moving us away from that and closer to him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just continue to give you thanks, Lord. Because there is no one else to thank in truth. There's no one else who's going to do this. There's no one else who can do this, Lord. And I thank you that you have shown us this and you are showing us these things. Lord, and I'm thankful for the opportunities. Father, please remind me and everyone else who would agree when the very difficult times come, and certainly they must, as your word proclaims, Lord, that this is an opportunity to honor you, to please you, to glorify you. Lord, through our right response of faith, you are going to make us the church you desire us to be. You will, Lord, conform us to the image of your Son. Lord, there's one of the passages in your word to your church that says, if any one of you thinks otherwise, the Lord will reveal even this to you. Father, we all know that you are faithful to complete the good work that you've begun. Lord, but my heart's desire, because I know it to be yours, as that it would happen sooner rather than later in your perfect way and will. So again, Lord, consistent with your word revealed to us in this chapter, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it's our reasonable service to just present ourselves to you. For all who would agree, Lord, individually, And together as that group, Father, we say to you, here are we. Please have your perfect way. As we ask it, thanking you always in faith, in Jesus' name. Amen? Shall we stand and sing his praises?